heart was so happy after speaking with Teo Drake. We discussed what it means to stay with heartbreak instead of denying it. Teo shared about what it means to live and die well. He shared about how grieving together builds community and reminds us of our connection with our beloveds. Teo Drake is a spiritual activist, an educator, a practicing Buddhist and yogi, and an artisan who works in wood and steel. A blue-collar, queer-identified trans man living with AIDS, Teo's activism exists at the intersections of gender, sexuality, race, class, ability, and spirituality. He's a founding member of the Transforming Hearts Collective, a four-person collective dedicated to the spiritual care and liberation of queer and trans people. He also serves on the faculty and board of Off the Mat Into the World, the National Advisory Board of the Transgender Law Center's Project, Positively Trans, and the Board of Fallacies, a theater project to help men in college dismantle patriarchy and counter gender-based violence. His writing can be found in the anthology Yoga and Body Image and at the blog Roots Grow the Tree. He can also be heard on the Healing Justice podcast, episode number 31. Enjoy the interview. Forward button. Hi, Teo. Thank hi you there. for hi. Thanks for being a yes to this conversation about grief and liberation. And um, I want to start us off with a moment of just centering and grounding. And so I invite you and the people watching or listening to find a comfortable way to be in your body, if that's possible right now. And you can close your eyes or soften your gaze. Just take a moment to connect with your breath, connect with your inhales and exhales. Notice how the breath is moving through your body. Each inhale and exhale. And now as you breathe, take a moment to connect with your heart, your heartbeat and heart space and notice what you're holding in your heart. What is present in your heart space right now? And take a few more deep cycles of breath. And then as you feel ready, you can open your eyes and reorient to the space. So we met recently in October um, in Montgomery, Alabama, at the Off the Mat Into the World Race in America program. And it was really sweet to meet you there. I've heard about you and your work for years, and it was nice to like meet you in person and connect in person. Um, and thanks again for, for being here and, and saying yes. Um, Absolutely. Love, yeah. I'd love for you to share some about what you do in the world, what your work is or practices in the world. You know, um, I'm, I'm kind of all over the place, and that's actually true physically and sort of, um, I think, sort of in the work I do. Um, you know, I'm, I often will describe myself as the Pied Piper of four to eight-year-olds, and so I my, my, one of my passions is teaching kids and I teach kids woodworking and martial arts and I occasionally get the, the gift of being able to teach kids um, asana too. And, and, and that's one of the places that feeds me sort of, I get to come home and I get to do that. And, um, and the transformational change work I do in the world is actually, um, 
in a few different places. Um, I, I'm part of a four person collective with my partner and two of our chosen family. And we do work in the world that is twofold. It's about sort of um, helping our folks, um, particularly queer and trans folks, access spiritual practice and resilience practices um, for our own survival and healing. And at the same time, working in dominant cultural spaces to begin to transform that culture so that when our folks show up, Right, they aren't met with the same level of violence that they currently are, and so it's we feel like it's this kind of trying to make the world better and trying to help our folks survive simultaneously. Right, um, and then I also do work particularly with um, spaces like, like off the mat and working in largely dominant cultural spaces around what are the transformational practices that um, for those of us whose identities align with dominant culture, particularly with white folks, what needs to be dismantled and mourned and put aside, right? And what are the, how do we use our practices to do that work? Um, and also for those of us where our identities are outside of that paradigm, um, how do we access sort of those practices for resilience, right? And, and what that work is. And because of who I am, I sort of straddle both those worlds. And so it depends sort of on where I am and, and what I'm doing. And, and the nuance of that, right? Mm -hmm. Of kind of floating back and forth in that way. Um, and then, you know, I, I often will retreat to a wood shop and make things as a as a moving meditation practice to keep doing this work. So that's pretty much what I do. Mm -hmm. You just mentioned in the work that you do, um, in particular with Off the Mat, that um, for folks who are, have closer proximity to power or mm -hmm. um, are closer to dominant culture and what it deems as mm -hmm. normal, that part of that work is, is um, acknowledging um, mourning and grieving and then figuring out how to reconnect with resilience and move forward. It sounds like that's mm -hmm. part of what Absolutely. you do. And so I'm wondering, given that this is a conversation about grief and liberation, what, um, what is the connection between the two, mourning and then resilience or liberation for you? I think heartbreak is essential, right? Because, um, and I think heartbreak that is resourced, right? As opposed to the heartbreak that sort of drops us to our knees um, and, and breaks us into pieces. Uh, the, the heartbreak that's actually resourced, particularly with practice and with community, um, has movement in it, right? It, I, in order to face what's hard, I, I, I'm, my heart's gonna be broken, right? And it's, it's possible for it not to be, um, but I've, in my own experience, I've found that there's, um, there's movement in, in heartbreak that has resource to it, that's intentional um, and that isn't done alone, right? That, that allows for this sort of ability to come in and out of it. And, and quite frankly, at least in my experience, the, the, the not facing grief and not facing loss requires me to shut down in this way that actively makes me forget who I am and makes me forget requires me to forget to whom I belong um, and in a way that the cost is too high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I was talking with my friend Omi who I interviewed for this summit and Omi described it as like a tourniquet that's put on part of yourself when you're not acknowledging the grief that may be there and, mm -hmm. and that something gets cut off and may not be able to be used again, um, which right. I thought was really powerful and what you just said mm -hmm. made me think about her. Um, and so I'm wondering what you, why you feel like, because I, I think about heartbreak a lot too, um, why it's important to be acknowledging heartbreak now um, mm -hmm. and, and how that might actually lead us to a space of more ease or freedom. I don't know if the answer to that is unilateral, right? I think that there's a lot of us who have always had to face heartbreak. Um, and then there's a lot of us, and particularly in the places that I, I do some work where um, there's been sort of permission and also I think a push to not face heartbreak. I think it's still there, right? But But the acknowledgement of it, the ability to sort of turn away from it is an option, right? Um, but I think in, and so I think we're, we're long overdue for, for this, right? right? We're long overdue for this sort of reckoning with grief and grieving. But at this particular moment, 
I think we're at um, a critical place politically, um, and and I think culturally at this moment, you know, I think the things have escalated to a point where it's visible, right? The harm that's happening is visible to more and more people, uh, and and we have the the ability to actually, I think, collectively talk to one another in a way that you know I'm 52 years old, and and the ability to actually to see what's happening outside of a very small space, um, I think is hard to do, but also is creating a reckoning that we can't ignore, right? Social media allows us to see um, in ways that are increasingly becoming harder and harder to ignore. And I think I think it's creating this sort of moment that that we can choose to face this. I think if we choose not to, and the we is kind of right, dicey in there, but if if we don't collectively face it, or at least in large part face it, um, it we're going to hit a point where I think there's it's going to be very difficult to turn back. Um, and I think that's my fear, right? Like, um, and I particularly think that the invitation for permission to grieve, right, and and to actually see this sort of level of heartbreak and um, and emotion, right, and and the the at least in in sort of my understanding that the ways that grief calls us to connect with other people, right, is to really believe that that's actually my birthright, that's actually, that's actually a healthy thing, it's a healing thing, it's actually the essence of, of my humanity, right, and my humanity's connection with yours. Um, that immediately begins to, 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 sell the, to sell out the lie that I've been taught, right, that I can make it on my own, that that's the only thing that's of value, all of that just crap that came as messages, right, the minute that I actually see the strength in the softness, the strength in the falling apart, and the strength in not being able to carry the load myself is the minute I begin to not participate in my own undoing and my culture's undoing mm -hmm. of all of us. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's so powerful, everything. I was like shaking my head the whole time. <laughs> everything you just right. said um, resonated so deeply. Um, and in particular, like how we grieve and what happens when we are able to soften into that and the heartbreak versus like have armor on, um, which I understand why people have armor on, right? Like energetically, the culture's challenging and difficult and mm -hmm. teaches us in so many ways to have armor um, and not connect. Right. And I heard in there, like part of what happens through the process of grieving and making space for grief is connection, right? And community and intimacy. Mm -hmm. And you also named it. So making space to grieve and being in community while doing so is counter to dominant culture. It's like dominant culture actually doesn't want us to be having this conversation right now. No, no, you know, absolutely not, right. like, let's not actually talk about the things that um, cause heartbreak for us. So yeah, that's deeply powerful. Um, so I'm curious about what lessons you've learned from grief and grieving because you, you talked about softening, which I also think is like vulnerability too, being in that space of mm -hmm. vulnerability and witnessing people in that space. Are there lessons that you've learned from making space to grieve? Yeah, you know, I think um, I, I've learned I can survive, right? I think this notion that, that oh my God, if I feel this, right, that I won't. Um, that was going to kill me like absolutely that was going to kill me and and i've learned that that if and again like sort of with practice and not alone um even i guess not in isolation i can be alone like as an introvert i can be alone right but not in isolation right um that i've learned that it that 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 my heart actually becomes stronger the more that i test it and the more that i let myself be held and and the more that I hold others, right? That's sort of the reciprocity of that. Um, and I learned that I that lesson came to me pretty young, or mm -hmm. or the the invitation to keep learning came pretty young, right? Like for me, the the AIDS epidemic hit in my teens and early twenties, but my entrance into queer community as a young adult was right as my friends were dying, and um, and so that 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 the having to to make sense of the incomprehensible to make sense of like people who were you know my close friends who were in their early 20s right and um 
dying of a disease that that in in the level of of touch deprivation and the level of of um, violent disregard from like our political structure and from in my you know in my early twenties right from adults right um, I could like my brain couldn't make any sense of that and I saw us love one another right I saw us um, touch when we were told not to touch and and um, and that taught me something that my brain couldn't catch up. I don't know even now, 30 years later, if my brain has caught up, but, but my heart knew that this was the way forward. Like the adults were telling me to do these things, right? And my heart and my love told me that to, to stay, right? To bury my friends, to, to, to show up at the hospital. Um, and even with my own diagnosis with HIV at a time where I was told to get my house in order, right? That I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna make it to 40 for sure. Um, the messages I kept hearing were to, you know, just, just get on with it, right? Just just do this. And and I felt like I needed to ha figure out how to, how to, how to die well, right? And to live well at the same time, all the time. And I was in my 20s, right? In my early 30s. And if you spend your entire adulthood figuring out how to live well and love well and know that that legacy is important, mm -hmm. it creates a, um, a heart crisis that if I let myself feel it, let me um, grieve in a way that was active and not um, stored up. Does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. there was a flow to that that has has ebbed and f has literally come in and out of every fiber of my being for most of my adulthood at this point in time, right? And and that that is something I take forward, right? I and I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be fifty two if I didn't figure out um, how to be with other people in my own grief and in this kind of collective horror mm -hmm. that was happening and feel joy right and like that grief doesn't grief never um minimizes joy and love it 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 makes those things matter more right it makes the little stuff in life just you know relegates it to its right place right mm -hmm. Right, and those are the things. Like it, it taught me to hug people and love people, and and literally grab them, physically grab them, and tell them I love them in a way that you know, is a little awkward, right? like for what our culture tells me I'm supposed to do. Those okay. are the things I think I've learned. You know, I'm a big teddy bear, and I show up full on, yeah. um, in a way that goes against, particularly goes against what manhood is supposed to be, right? Mm -hmm. And grief let me dare to do that in a way that mm. I don't know, I don't know I would have had the guts to do it um, in the ways that I do it if I wasn't aware of what loss is mm -hmm. and how loss creates value, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's just true. Yeah. Yeah. How did your heart know to... Um not listen to what the adults or culture was telling you to do and instead to, as you name, show up at the hospital, bury your friends, right? The, work with this frame of living well and dying well. Like how, you know, you were in your 20s and early mm -hmm. 30s, you mm -hmm. said, how did, how did your heart know? Which you may not be able to answer that. It just makes me wonder like what conditions were in place for you to, mm -hmm. for your heart to actually do for you to actually be with your heart, right? And move from your heart mm -hmm. instead of what culture was telling you to do. And that's where my belief in the divine comes from, right? Like, I think I've always known that I wasn't alone, that I was accompanied. And to this day, I don't, I can't tell you what form the divine takes. I just know that um, I've just never been alone. Um, and that's very different than sort of my Catholic upper upbringing or any other kind of, you know, institutional lessons I was given about who God was and is. Um, so I think that that um, grace is a big part of that, right? That, that, that um, 
I think we're capable of more than our own imagination in the face of grace, right? In the face of the divine. And it was very clear to me that these young people, like, you know, my friend Sean, who is, you know, 23 years old and this very sweet flamboyant redhead, you know, like, and, and there's no way to, 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 to know who he was, right? And in his, in his dying to know who he is in that moment and in any way, shape or form, stay present for him and believe what I was hearing. Like they, they were, the cacophony of that was impossible. And I think being queer and being gender nonconforming and in my early twenties and very rebellious led to, led me to be like, I don't know what this is, but that's wrong, right? And, and I think the hypocrisy of, of how I was treated growing up, particularly in like a Catholic context, right? Particularly in the 70s, you know, um, already led me to be deeply suspicious, mm -hmm. right? I was already like pretty wary about what authority figures were telling me to be true. Like some of it was bold-faced lies that I knew. Um, and so I already was coming in with a healthy dose of skepticism and there was no way that those human beings that that I deeply loved were in any way, shape, or form flawed or responsible for what was happening, right? Like, and so something had to give. And, and again, like, I don't, I don't need to know why, and and I never really needed to know why. I think I just needed to do the next right thing, mm -hmm. which for me was right was to keep showing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, showing up and being present, and yeah, mm -hmm. staying present to yeah. what is to what was happening. Mm -hmm. Are there, um, I think there are, but practices or rituals you engage to help you move through grief? Um, maybe practices that connect you with grace or the divine or mm -hmm. rituals that you can just share and, and name? Yeah. Um, the one that will always bring me um, to presence really quickly is is to is to kneel down and to put my forehead on the floor right to 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 privilege my heart over my head mm. right? there's a level of sort of humility in the bowing down um, and breathing to let myself have enough time you know in, in in what commonly is known as child's pose right to let myself fully be in contact with the floor in a way that um, has a melting aspect right mm -hmm. to that um, that is is a, it has a visceral embodied feel to me that I can't explain and it always has um, the minute I, I used to do it in other ways I think particularly in a tr trauma response sort of way um, but the minute I was taught like that to make that contact with the floor um, or if someone helped me get into that pose I was like oh right like like my heart just sort of showed up in a way that I could then ritualistically do that over and over again. I think I'm, I'm a deep believer in simple ritual mm -hmm. because it um, brings my nervous system along, right? Particularly as a trauma survivor. And so I think the least complicated and fancy sort of, of, of process is really just bowing down and putting my forehead on the floor. And I, and, um, and I do that daily, sometimes or several times a day, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, Tonglen practice, like the, the actual um, giving me the structure and the, and the practice to turn towards grief and the sort of, I think, um, giving me the language and the validation that that's a, that's a practice that will, that will transform the armor that, that I, that keeps building up because mm -hmm. the world is what it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so heart-centered practices, um, particularly, Tonglen has, has um, again, it, it's given me, I think, some language that I needed um, for something I intuitively knew to be true. And it gave me a ritual process to go through um, that, that resonates deeply with me. Um, and then honestly playing with kids. Um, I think there's this level of, um, I, the sense of wonder is the other side of the coin, I think, of of where grief doesn't need to become bitter or jaded, mm -hmm. right? And so I think for me, there's the, um, being able to play with kids and and um, 
and know that sort of life goes on, right? While I hold sometimes a heavy heart is another piece of that for me that, that keeps me, I think, present in a, in a way that um, takes some of the edge off of what the world can sometimes do to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How do you, um, well, I imagine that you, when you work with kids, you're probably doing it in a different way than what dominant culture wants you to do, right? And so I'm, I'm curious about your work with them and how you're creating different conditions than the ones maybe you experienced growing up, mm -hmm. um, given family, given the Catholic church, right? Systems mm -hmm. that were in place, um, dominant culture. Like how do you, what conditions are you creating for these children that you, get to work with, right? Have the privilege yeah. of, of working with. You know, talk about grief. One of the hardest things I was told when um, I was considering gender transition and in the sort of early stages of trying to figure out what kind of man I was going to be, right? Because I knew what the messages were. And that was one of the things where I was like, like, I'm not that. So I don't know what to do next because I can't imagine manhood outside of what I had been told. And I remember very clearly when someone told me, you're never going to be able to, to be alone with kids again, right? You're never going to be able to, to hold kids. Like people are going to treat you with suspicion, right? You know, and, and it, it, there is a different relationship that I have to have with kids for, you know, good reasons, right? you know, but I was like, is that true? You know, and, and so um, part of this for me about being with kids is I think it's really important for kids to see gentlemen who are also still powerful, right? Like this, you know, I, I teach martial arts to kids and I think it's really Im important to see sort of um, a playful, heart-centered adult man in their lives that, that right, where like, you know, touch is playful and it is, you know, like we're, we're doing a thing together and at the same time um, being able to actually like kneel down and look in their eyes, pay attention, right? Um, also the, the level of the things I wasn't given, right? So I, I've taught a lot of kids where I, I, there's boys who show up with their nails painted, right? Mm -hmm. For martial arts class, which you can imagine like the daring that that takes in you know, sort of the world, right? And, right. And, right? and being able to be like, I so like those colors, right? Like the level of attending to, um, partly attending to each kid and I think also attending to um, paying attention to the parts of, of each, each human being, but particularly each child where I think this is where the world might be rough on you, right? Like, mm -hmm. and, to, and to try to pay attention to that in a way that is noticing, right? And, it, and I think it's rare that in a world that moves very quickly um, for adults to have time with kids, particularly kids who aren't their own, mm -hmm. right? Um, where you actually stop for a second and meet eye to eye and are like, you know, like, like I see you and, and, you know, that thing you're doing might not be okay with me, right? But you're okay with me. Um, I, I just think that part of it is time with kids too. But, but I definitely think that the creating, for me at least, creating um, a particular version of manhood that, that, um, did not, I don't need to concede what about me is absolutely powerful um, in order for me to be gentle and loving. Like those things, I am far more strong because I am a big teddy bear, right? Um, that that strength that can bend, right, is, is a strength that'll survive. Mm -hmm. And that I think for me with kids is a big part of that. I don't, I don't think that kids often have enough exposure um, to that in, in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of teaching children to not feel, right, <laughs> and not grieve, and mm -hmm. um, to be tough in these ways that I feel like are just soul crushing, um, yeah. and don't do any, it's like a disservice to humanity right. um, to, yep. to be with children or really anyone in that way where you're, you're telling them to cover up who they are, right? right. And to, um, right. not feel things and that's the way we move forward which is so not how we are going to move through this right right and that there's you know like 
and that there's something that you can do when you feel right like it's the feeling doesn't have to overwhelm you right mm -hmm. we've you know teaching kids how to be angry right like that there's nothing wrong with being angry and right it doesn't need to consume you right like, like you can be incredibly sad and right it doesn't need to consume you and and what do we do with that right like i think it's again it comes back to even with kids it comes down to practice mm -hmm. um and letting people letting kids know that that there's a way to move through things that bring them along with us as opposed to tuck them in a pocket right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that leads me to um a question about um culture prioritizing space for us to feel right grieve feel be who we are the inner wholeness like what would it look like for um and, and we are, I mean, what you're naming is you're creating ways, you're creating conditions that are very different than what dominant culture does. So you are creating this new way of being or different way of being. So I'm wondering what you feel like it might look like if culture did prioritize space for us to feel, grieve, feel our wholeness and humanity, possibly find some ease and freedom through that. What, what would that look like? Could it look like, yeah, what could it look mm. like? <laughs> right. Again, I think it's a it's a bit back to sort of um, I don't know that my imagination is like my human imagination and my life experience could tell you what it would look like. I deeply believe it's possible, right? Um, and I and I believe that it. Um, I think it would. I think there would be a feel to it, right? Like there, would, it would it would it would have the level of sort of. Um, again, ease and breath, but also this sort of um, lack of separation, mm -hmm. right? This, this, um, if we had the space to, to sort of feel our feelings and, and particularly right, sort of with grief and, um, I think everything would be different, right? I think that we just wouldn't be in the place that we often are as a culture. To, you know, um, I think dominance. We it wouldn't. We wouldn't have to have that, right? Uh, you know, I don't think we have to have it anyway. But you know, like if if we could sort of see our, our emotions and our experiences as things that we can transform and become part of the, the the weave of who we are, both individually, right, and also the weave of of who we are. I don't know that those categories would matter, and particularly the value the values that we associate with categories. I just don't think that that stuff would be, would be part of a human condition anymore. Mm -hmm. um, because I think so much of, of, of dominance, so much of the culture that's been built, um, colonization in its own self, right, comes out of this notion of um, not, n not seeing, right, not connecting, not feeling, right? You, you can't do any of those things if you feel. Mm -hmm. particularly if you feel in a way that leads you towards connection with our human beings, right? Everything in this system has required a turning away from and only feeling, I think, the pseudo emotions that pull you out of connection and out of awareness, right? And so I think much of the violence that we see and much of the, the separation that we see, it just wouldn't have the fuel if we were, if everything we felt was woven just without effort into who we are and the ways that we come together, mm -hmm. right? So I think that everything about this world would change. I think the one thing wouldn't change was sort of like human to human heart connection wouldn't change, right? Because I think that's our birthright. That's the thing that 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 we've constantly been pressured to forget um, that I think is the essence of sort of our instinct, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to live in that world. You and me both. <laughs> right, <laughs> make right. this happen. I mean, we are right, making right. it happen. Right. right I'm right. like, I want to be there. I was so involved in listening. I was like, I right. want to, I want to be there, um, and have that space to breathe and be and feel and connect in the in the ways you just named. So it may be the same answer um, that you just gave. But what does collective liberation mean to you? I think the, the the end goal would be probably the same, but I think it's um, I think how we each get there 
is probably a slightly different path, right? Um, I believe that that collective liberation, particularly, you know, for white folks, for particularly for folks um, closer to power, right? Um, that liberation is about um, is is about putting down mm -hmm. the lessons and the all of the the, the baggage that we carry um, about who we are that has that we have traded our parts of our humanity for, right? And I think for those of us who are from much farther away from from those power structures, um, I think it's 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 that that path to collective liberation is about the reclamation of what we've known to be true, right? Like like what happens in the in the quiet contact, at least in my language, like my quiet contact with the divine, right? All of the truths that get whispered around me um, that I have to sort of guard still, right? Because the people want to take it, that I, I don't wouldn't have to guard that, right? That that and then I think the the ways that the putting down and the picking up and the holding and the reclaiming come together, right? Mm -hmm. Um I think a lot about that in terms of collective liberation. Um, it is an unburdening on some level, and a um, and I think uh, I think a, a, a standing in on another level, right? Like, if that makes sense. And again, I think we get to a place where we don't have the the sort of power differential and all of those things. But um, but I think the I actually think the healing is in the path to collective liberation as opposed to the arrival in, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of, a lot of sense. Um, is there anything else you want to share about, you've shared a lot about grief and liberation and practices and ideas about how we make more space to feel and to remember our divinity is what I, a lot of what I heard and what you mm -hmm. shared. Is there anything else you want to share with people watching or listening um, about grief or liberation or both? Mm. I think there's nothing that our hearts don't already know how to do. Like I really believe that. Like that um, that my head can can tell me I've gone too far or um, or to tread lightly. And I, but I believe my divine birthright um, resides in my soul and in my heart. And there's nothing that my heart can't do or can't take when I'm fully present, right? And fully resourced in, in connection both with myself, um, with the divine, and then with my beloveds, right? And, and part of this work for me has been to sort of ever expand that sort of level of to whom I belong, right? And and so I think when when we have this sense that that of belonging that is so deeply heart centered, um, grief isn't something to be feared. It's it's a reminder of how deeply connected we are. Right. I only fear grieving and loss in a way that when I feel like my um, connection to others is 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 fragile right and but when i really understand to whom i belong and this sense of beloved that that grief is just a reminder that that there's something here right um and something worth being here for that um that I have to come back to practice to remind myself because mm -hmm. I don't hear those messages right out in the world in mm -hmm. the same way. Um, but that the divine and and those I've been blessed to practice with in community um, remind me and hold me when when it is hard to remember on my own accord. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that the big piece is that um, that grief with belonging is imminently transformational. And so it's attending to the belonging will aid in the grieving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that just makes me remember, which I, I 
already knew, but remember, you know, every, it's like grief is a universal experience. Everyone's gonna, everyone's grieving in some way, even when they're not acknowledging it. And so this, mm -hmm. the frame of like grief and belonging and, and connection in that way feels really profound. And I think part of our work is to acknowledge that everyone's grieving in some way individually. And then what that means is we're grieving collectively too, and to turn mm -hmm. towards that. Um, and be with each other, be with one another through that. Earlier, you mentioned legacy, and um, I'm wondering, and you mentioned living well and dying well. So I'm wondering what you want um, your legacy to be, which was not a question on the list. It's just me and what you share. Like, what do you want? How do you want to leave this place mm -hmm. um, differently than the way, like, how do you want it to be? Mm -hmm. And what do yeah. you want to leave? I think about that a lot. Um, I want to leave this place l more well loved, right? Like, and and I mean that in a visceral, right? Like, um, and I want that. I want anyone who has crossed my path, particularly, um, particularly people that I've had um, connection to, um, to feel that 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 loved in a way that conveys worthiness and conveys um protectiveness like that i feel like if if i leave this world um sooner than i might otherwise hope right that that level of sort of um that that level of love as a force right mm -hmm. gets imprinted in a way that um again that can always serve to call someone home i think that's you know if i leave the world with that legacy then then the lessons that i learned the hard way are worth every penny that they've cost me right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you for for sharing that um and sharing everything that you shared in this conversation and I mean, I, I feel spirit in you. Like I see that and everything. I hear it, see it, feel it. Um, and I, I try to see the divinity in everyone and I just hear it come through so clearly and, and how you are showing up, right? And how you are living life and um, prioritizing connection and, and intimacy and care. So I am just deeply appreciative of how you show up, even though we just, we just met a little while ago. But I'm, Thank know you. that I'm um that's from the heart like I'm really I feel like you're you offered a lot of gifts through this conversation um, and so I'm appreciative of you being willing to do so and I'm wondering if if there are things coming up in 2020 that you want folks to know about or if, if there's a way folks can connect with you if you want them to be able to mm -hmm. anything you want to share um we do have, and I know that that as part of the website, there'll be a way to get in touch with sort of our collective that does transformational change work. Um, and so, by all means, there's a there's certainly um, through the website there's a contact form. Um, and I, I would I love sort of people reaching out just to to connect. I think I deeply believe in co-created space and co-created. Um, work right so conversations like this resource me in a way that. Um, nothing else does right like this ability to co-create um i don't do sort of outwardly facing work in a way that like i don't leave re leave retreats and things like that but but definitely um particularly in terms of like practice and access particularly for queer and trans folks um like i'll show up 24 7 so and i would think the easiest way is to reach out through the, our website great so. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, showing up for this conversation and sharing and being you, being who you are in this world. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Same here. Thank, Thank you, you for, for being who you are and making this easy to have a conversation like this. Yeah, good. I'm glad it felt easy. <laughs> mm -hmm.